Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Chris's Ticks. Today we'll be having a look at yet another Timex. Just kidding, you probably already read the title card. We'll be having a look at the Invicta Pro Diver Zagar, otherwise better known as the Invicta 1953. I realize I'm not super quick to the party, but that's okay. In short, we can end the video here. It's great. I like almost everything about it, especially the MSRP of about 100 US dollars. If you'd like to know more, then keep watching. Otherwise, yeah, close the video, you're done. Good to go. Just get one. $100. So, why is it known as the Invicta 1953? Well, it draws inspiration heavily from here. The Rolex 1953 Submariner. I'm not going to talk too much about this as I'm no Rolex expert, or as I call it, Rolexpert. However, I'm very glad that Invicta chose to do this, because I think it's an excellent look, especially compared to their other offerings. I'll put it beside another Pro Diver that I got for exceptionally cheap, and you can see for yourself. I'll also just straight up say it, the other Pro Diver is just not very nice, but it is a good vessel to hold spare NH35 parts. So let's go over this offering from Invicta and see why I like it so much, and where I think it could be a little bit better. First, let's start with the box, and yes, this time I'll actually talk about it. It is their signature yellow, and it's a lot of box for not a lot of money. It's actually a bit too much box for the money. Others have said it, and I'm going to say it too, because what else am I if not a parrot? It's a large box, seems to be made out of pretty reasonable materials, with a felt-covered foam for the insert and lining of the inside of the box. In the box itself, you'll get the generic instruction manual that basically cover the entire Invicta lineup. The box is, again, like I said, very nice. It really could have been a whole lot less nice if it meant some money went towards a couple tweaks that could have been done for the watch. In short, give me less box, more watch. The bracelet. It's a standard fold-over bracelet with Invicta stamped on the back. Nothing super special. No extensions, and it's pretty conventional for its pin-based micro-adjustments. The links fold and move pretty well, and it's overall fairly comfortable. It allows for the watch to sit comfortably on my wrist, which is about 6.25 inches. Also, no hair pulling when I wear it. All in all, for the $100 USD price point, it's very good. The watch case. You may have guessed it, but I enjoy this case shape a lot. It comes in at 40 millimeters, and for the money, there's a surprising amount of work put into the case. Major visible surfaces have a brushed finishing, while the chamfers are polished. The crown is also a screw-down crown with an Invicta logo embossed on it, and I personally think that it's pretty well done. The sides are clean, no giant Invicta lettering on here. On the back, we have a display case back with polished stainless steel and a mineral glass window. The polished material of the case back kind of clashes with the rest of the finish, but it looks all right. Plus, it's going to be on the back of your hand anyways. The display case back itself it's also alright. The NH35A is not particularly pretty, but it's helped a bit by the Invicta decorated rotor. The bright yellow is fairly interesting, and it does make for something interesting to look at on a basically finished NH35A. The only thing that I would have liked changed on the case would be swapping out the flat mineral crystal with an acrylic, but otherwise, it's fine. I've worn it more than the average for my watches, and I haven't really dinged it yet, so that's kind of nice. Plus, all of that, and it still has a 200 meter water resistance rating. So, hooray! The dial. As noted previously, it's borrowed heavily from the Rolex Submariner 1953. From the indices, the hands, the mini track, and their overall coloring. The result is a very nice homage. The only thing that's missing is the loomed second hand. But, at least the style of the hand is the same. Now, I can't speak to the dial and hand quality compared to the Rolex, for I have not seen the Rolex Submariner in 1953, but on the Invicta, it looked pretty good, and there's nothing wrong with the print quality on the dial. The hands, to me, are pretty good to my eyes. So, what movement powers the watch? Well, I already mentioned it. The NH35A. Just in case you're unfamiliar with the NH35A, let's rattle off some numbers and features. The movement beats at 21,600 beats per hour. It has a power reserve of 41 hours and has bi-directional winding via the magic lever. It hacks and has a pretty standard three-hand arrangement with calendar complication. 
Strange though, right? If you notice the dial, it has no calendar cutout, but the crown does indeed have the calendar setting position. So I suspect that the disc is removed as turning the crown yields no clicks of the disc in this position. I am frankly glad they didn't just cut a date window. I'm a fan of the no date dial. Now it's time. Loom test time. For this test, we'll pit the Invicta against the Seiko 5KX, an AliExpress homage Heimdaller bronze sumo dive watch, the Bulova Hack field watch, and I'll hit all the watches with a UV bulb for about 30 seconds and then cut the lights. Camera set to 1 15th shutter speed, f2.8, ISO 3200 when we're shooting the loom. Not super surprising, but the Invicta doesn't do so well. It's the first one to drop out, followed by the Bulova Hack watch, with the sumo leg going next, and the 5KX finishing on top. As I mentioned, it's not super surprising since nowhere does Invicta mention any fancy loom being used on its website. Time to talk bucks. In general, this is $99 USD, or about $125 Canadian. Yes, that's the actual conversion as of this recording. No hyperbole today. That is simply an excellent, excellent price. I'll link to some online stores down below. Again, I'm not affiliated or anything. It's an excellent price on every level. For the case finishing, for an NH35 powered watch, for a dive watch with a screw down crown. Given all of that, it's hard to find similar watches that aren't quartz for this price point. Even if you factor in quartz watches, the price is still amazing. Additionally, unlike my Timex M79 video, where I don't compare watches from AliExpress, this one, I think it's fair game gives almost all the AliExpress watches that I have a run for its money when it comes to watches in the same price bracket. If you want a dive-style watch, even from AliExpress, there are a plethora of homage ones powered by DG2813s or ST1612s, but the list of NH35-powered divers or diver-style watches becomes short with the venerable Steel Dive Captain Willard homage, which, in my opinion, is a similar value watch. It's a watch that I don't yet have, but I've handled a few from friends that do have them. And for style points, the Captain Willard is fantastic. I think it does edge out the Invicta, but the size of the Invicta is what makes it for me. My wrists aren't super big. Like I said, 6.25 inches, approximately 160 millimeters. Wrapping this up, would I recommend the Invicta Zagar 1953? Yep, yep, yep. I personally think it's the best budget diver currently to date. Almost everything about the watch is good or can be excused given the crazy price tag. I've now had this watch for a few months, specifically since about mid-August, and it's consistently made it onto my wrist at least once per two weeks. And again, I gotta reiterate, that's a lot for me. In that time, I've also kept it on the stock bracelet. It's comfortable enough, and I don't mind it. Although personally, I do tend to wear watches with NATO straps. And I have to circle back to the watch price again for the billionth time, because it's not ignorable, in a good way. If you've made some judgments about the brand before, give this one a second look. It is really different from most of their lineup. Let me know, what do you think of this Invicta? Do you have one? Like, comment, and subscribe below. Till next time, bye.